There it is. Recording in progress. So we are recording this for all of the people who missed on the first two presentations, the 1860s and 70s. If you did not get to see those, uh, please let me know. I will send them to you as attachments so you may watch them after the fact. So that's not a problem. Just shoot me an email and we'll get you all set. I am going to put my contact information here into the chat window. So everyone will be able to shoot me an email or a phone call if you need to. So my email address, there's that and my phone number. And my cat is wondering why I've stopped petting her. Okay, so let's get going. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat window and we will get you an answer. If I don't know the answer, that's fine. There are plenty of things I don't know and I will try to get you the answer with some post presentation research. So don't worry if, if you have a question, go ahead and ask. and We'll get you all set one way or the other. Okay, we are doing the 1880s. We've had two of these presentations so far, and this is number three as we continue our march along. If you had any questions from the previous two presentations, you're welcome to shout them out here. Here I am. There's my contact information, my email, and I put my phone number into the chat window. So this one is a bit of a segue into uh, something else we're gonna be talking about, something that did happen in the 1880s, although it happened a little bit farther away from here, and that was the admission of the Dakotas into the United States. Very exciting. I hope you've all been to visit the Dakotas. The fun thing about it is we don't actually know which one came first. So there had been a move to get the Dakotas in as a territory, of course, but the thought was that they were going to be the same territory. The Republicans were pressuring President Harrison to create two Dakotas because then they would have more power in the Senate. Two more Republican leaning states meant four more senators, and that would help the Republican Party along. So President Harrison looked with the folks in charge and said, all right, well, we could put a line here and that would give us two territories. <clears throat> they looked at the population in both and the population was adequate to make two territories. So North and South Dakota were created. And hold on just a moment. <laughs> Sorry, bright light. Uh, North and South Dakota were created as the 39th and 40th states to the Union. The fun part is we don't know which was 39th and we don't know which was 40th because President Harrison didn't want to seem to show favoritism to one state over the other. So what he did is he hid the mess or he hid the piece of paper. Actually, what I should say is he took the two pieces of paper for the signing. And then he shuffled them up so that the onlooker, onlookers couldn't tell which ones was on top, which one was on top. And then he signed them and then he shuffled them up again. And then he gave them over to the folks to handle all things legal. So even today, we do not know which one was actually first, South Dakota or North Dakota. In general, North Dakota is said to have been the 39th state because they do it alphabetically. So it's kind of one of those quirky little things. Every other state, we know when it was a state, the order it was made a state, but for North and South Dakota, we do not. So in 1889, these twins were brought into the United States. So just a weird little quirk there. Okay, I've tried, I tried putting in fewer slides this time because I'm talking too much and I'm running over on time. So we're going to try to have a few fewer slides on this one. Okay, some notables from this decade, and by no means is this everything that is in that decade. 
Colorado Electric Company. Uh, you may know the name of Walter Cheeseman. Cheeseman, of course, would end up becoming associated with water in Denver, but he and several other folks were involved with electricity as well. Today, the Colorado Electric Company would be better known by a, a name we all know, I suppose, if we use electricity, XL Energy in Colorado. I like this part here, not necessarily because I'm a gigantic fan, Oscar Wilde. I like some of his stuff, um, The Happy Prince. I like that story. But the reason I mentioned this is because when Oscar Wilde came to Colorado to speak, he did go up into the mountains. He had a lot of very interesting things and fascinating and funny things to say about his visit in Colorado. When he was up in Leadville, he described one of the meals he had there saying that the first course of the meal was whiskey, the second course of the meal was whiskey, and the third course of the meal, I bet you could guess it, was whiskey. And he described the miners as being great fellows, uh, not as rough as he thought they might be. So for those of you who've ever traveled along the Highline Canal, the Highline Canal opened in this part of the world as well. And, we are still enjoying it today, although it wouldn't come open to uh, the general public until uh, the 1970s. And sorry, I'm admitting more people here to the presentation. And then the Mulkery, for those of you who live out in the Montclair neighborhood, this wonderful building, still going strong today, still serving as sort of the community center for the place. And that is a list of just some of the notables from this time period. Around Denver, some other things that came in. Castle Rock was incorporated, 1881. It was actually settled in the 1870s, but as with many things, it takes a while to get everything up into legal status. And so 1881, incorporated as a city. Some of the cities we are gonna be talking about tonight a little bit, uh, some of these, I should say, the city of Harmon. Today, you would know Harmon as Cherry Creek. Harmon was just not a, an evocative enough of a name. Louise and Edwin Harmon came into Denver and they settled an area so that they could be farmers. Later on, it would become Cherry Creek. So another city, South Denver, not a particularly creative name, but there it goes. I bet you could guess where it was in relation to the city of Denver. South of Alameda, that was the city of South Harmon. Then you also had the city of Barnum. I suppose you could guess where that gets its name. Believe it or not, P.T. Barnum was not just doing circus, he was also doing real estate. And the city of Valverde, which we will be talking about tonight, 1888, one of, the thing, one of the things that comes up frequently is local pronunciation versus, versus linguistic or national pronunciation. For whatever reason, and I have no idea why, locally it's pronounced Valverde. It's the same reason Buena Vista is pronounced Buena Vista. It's a local pronunciation. So it is a great mystery. It is, it is just, uh, oh, to this side, I'm at my mother-in-law's house. The next street in this direction is uh, Zunai, and then the one behind that is Tihon. What are you going to do? All right, so let's have a little jaunt, shall we? So for those of you not familiar with Denver urbanism, Denver urban, urbanism is where I got this. They have a population expansion chart that goes through from the 1880s on into the modern day. So this one is from the Denver urbanism site. If you haven't visited Denver Urbanism, they have many resources there. And I have gotten these maps from there, so please give them a go. So this shows the present boundaries of the city and county of Denver. And where you see those red dots or squares, that is development that went in during that decade. So this would be a great juxtaposition if you were to have all of them downloaded on your computer, you could just cycle through, which I've done on some of my presentations. And then you may watch the blobs of red just expand outward. So folks, if you haven't visited, it's a great thing. Go have a look. And I thought I'd expand here. 
just zoom in a little bit so you can see a little bit more. Okay, so the Union Station, Auraria, and Central Business District area in there, they don't really include those, but you see other neighborhoods around that downtown core already beginning in the 1880s to see expansion. Notice where you see five points, Whittier, City Park West, that area. Curtis Park was the first streetcar suburb in Denver that is for the city included in the Five Points neighborhood, where you see the NTS in Five Points. Today, most people would call that the Curtis Park neighborhood. So this going strong. And in fact, the picture that you see here on the right-hand side shows Five Points at this time. You are looking east from the Gilpin School, which is at, I think, 27th and Welton, I think it is. 29th and Welton, sorry. Couldn't remember the exact uh, address there. So this is looking east, southeast from the Gilpin School. What a difference. No city park, no Clayton neighborhood or anything over there. And of course, very few trees to speak of. So let's zoom in a little bit more here. On some other pictures from the area. So what was happening Downtown Denver had started out as our main commercial spot, but even though 14th Street and uh, that area had beautiful houses, eventually downtown Denver was becoming more commercial. So what that meant is people were being forced out of their homes in downtown Denver simply by the commercial push, uh, the presence of retail and such. Here you see a picture from downtown Denver that building that you see there, that very large building still stands in downtown Denver. And if you look, my goodness, so many little streetcars and carriages and just lots and lots of horses. So this picture is from the 1880s. Over here on the right-hand side, another picture of the Five Points neighborhood in Denver. In this case, you're looking off toward the Northwest. And as you see, a whole lot of empty space there. So the city of Denver, at this point, pushing out of downtown, going in every direction crazily. Uh, in the description that I did for this presentation, I think I said something like, <clears throat> Denver goes boom. And it really is the case. The city did not expand uh, the previous two decades to the extent that it would in this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. so. There is a lot to say about this decade. So let's look at some of the pieces. Here we have some of the buildings that came in in this decade. If you look at the two pictures, the upper middle and the upper left, those are some pictures of our Colorado State Capitol being built. The land for the Colorado State Capitol was donated by Henry Brown in 1868. He did so from the fullness of his heart because he was such a great guy. Don't believe it, it's total hokum. No, he totally donated the land so he could get rich, 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 rich. And it worked, although it just worked on a delayed schedule. From the presentation we talked about last week, or last week, last month, he actually sued to get the land back because the city was not building quickly enough. That court case was not decided in his favor. And after Denver was designated as the final and affirmed territory, or excuse me, capital for the state, then they started to build the capital. So that actually happened in 1881. Even though we were made a state, it was not until um, 1881 that we actually decided we would officially choose Denver as our capital. So there is that. Oh no, I forgot to read out a quote here. From here. Oh, I forgot to read my quote. Okay. Okay. This is what the city, this is how the city was described in 1880. Quote The streets are broad, solid, and clean, lined in all directions with massive blocks of elegant residences and pretty cottages in the midst of running water, handsome shade trees, green lawns, and pleasant groves. The building of the modern city has been fairly inaugurated. 
So I thought I'd share that little quote, forgot to do it. Okay, where's all this money coming from? Well, one of the things we talked about in the last presentation was the explosion of riches from the mountains, especially in Leadville. And almost all of that wealth flowed into the Denver metro area and absolutely led to a building increase. So 1881, the uh, city of Denver is made the official capital. And then we began construction on some other buildings. I wrote down the dates here. The building on the far right-hand side, that is the Arapahoe County Courthouse. That is not the Capitol building. That building on the right-hand side no longer stands. For those of you who know where the Sheraton Hotel, I think it's a Sheraton, in downtown Denver, there at Court Place. Court Place gets its name from the fact that it's where the courthouse was. The courthouse that you see there, beautiful building, sadly torn down in the 1930s, uh, went up in 1886. So that's the Arapahoe County Courthouse. The city hall that you see in the lower left-hand side there, also torn down in the 18, uh, excuse me, in the 1930s, uh, was built in 1884. I write all these dates down because there are simply too many dates to remember most of them. So the city was building up really fast. We were the seat of government now officially, and so we were going to make it last. The Capitol building that you see there in the upper left-hand side does share one curious thing. It was built by the gentleman you see there on the right-hand side, Mr. Elijah Myers. Mr. Myers also designed the capitals in Lansing, Michigan, and in Austin, Texas. A key two things to remember, if you go to the capital in Austin, Texas, it's not pink. No, no, no. The capital in Austin is sunset red very important. And when you go to the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan, uh, just prepare your neck to be craned upward because it's a very tall building. That's really a great, great building. Both of them are worth a go, both done by Elijah Myers. Uh, in the end, I think, though, I actually like the Texas one better than ours. If you look at the picture on the left-hand side here, that is a picture from the State Capitol building. So you are looking toward the east, excuse me, toward the west, northwest. So that tall building that you see there with the smokestack on it, that intersection is Colfax and Broadway. The street that runs just to the, how do I do this? Okay, where the smokestack is, that's on the south side of the building. On the north side of the building, that's Colfax. And then between us and that building is Broadway. That is a cable car barn. And that's also where they had the cable, the wheels that do the cables around. Uh, we would end up getting rid of our cable cars, of course, uh, replaced with streetcars, our standard electric power streetcars. Fun thing that I recently learned, I knew it was down there somewhere, but if you look to the right of that building, that tall building, you see sort of a whitish building with a little cupola at the top, that was Denver's first fire station. N those buildings don't exist now. This uh, would end up becoming Denver's Civic Center Park in this area. All right, although that was years in the future from this point. All right, oh, I forgot to say, it's not. Um, I am by no means telling all of the stories from the 1880s. There are many things that I could have said. I had to choose some stories. So I apologize in advance if I don't share the important stories from the 1880s in your opinion. Uh, too much to say. So I apologize now for the ones that I am going to miss. I'm definitely going to miss some. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Fort Sheridan. No, let's talk a little bit about Fort Logan. So Fort Logan, as we call it today, was begun in 1887. The federal government of the United States decided that as we had fewer uh, difficulties, as they said at the time, with the Native Americans, we needed fewer forts so their function could be consolidated into other forts or into newer forts. What they decided to do was create <coughs> 
some new forts closer to larger cities where they could be sustained by the cities. They'd have easier access, those sorts of things. So what they decided was they would create one Southwest Denver called Fort Sheridan. All right, I wrote it down here about 10 miles southwest of town, yes. So we had our railroad, we had everything we needed. Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan was the one who chose this site and he labeled it Camp Near the City of Denver. Well, because he is the one who chose it, the folks in the area were calling it Fort Sheridan. Well, in the end, they asked General Sheridan, we have multiple forts that are getting called Fort Sheridan, which one would you like to carry your name? In the end, he chose for one near Chicago to carry his name. We didn't wanna have two Fort Sheridans after all. So what they did is they named it after John Alexander Logan, who had served the Union during the Civil War. He had become uh, the grand, uh, first commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. He ended up being the person who put the work through to get the creation of a holiday to honor those who had died in war that would end up becoming our Memorial Day. So Fort Logan, originally Fort Sheridan, you see a picture on the upper part of the screen. Many of the buildings of Officers Row are still there. You look at the picture on the lower left-hand side, they believe it or not have a museum on the campus and you may go and learn all about its history. The last time I was there, it was free. So if you haven't been, you should go give it a go. It got started during the 1880s. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yeah, it was called Decoration Day. So Denver goes boom. That meant that pretty much every industry that could come here did, and others that were already here expanded. This was the time when the cattle industry in Denver began to go bananas. So one of the folks, uh, excuse me, one of the entities that was created at the time, in 1881, the Denver Union Stockyard was created. Manufacturing of everything increased. Bricks, flour, beer, more everything really in the upper right hand side that is the overland overland cotton mill the denver paper mill in the middle lower you see the colorado iron works the colorado milling and uh, elevator company factories tended to locate on the outskirts of town you were farther away from the population center so people weren't going to complain about the smell or anything else that you were doing also land tended to be cheaper in the Denver area, that often meant that you located on the northern part of the city's boundaries or even just outside of the city's boundaries. So today, if you think of where Globeville is, we put a lot of things that were smelly up in that part of the world. Uh, sorry about that, Adams County. All right, let me make sure. So I wrote down some numbers here. I looked up the history of the Overland Cotton Mill that you see up there. Uh, the workers were generally paid for their work 30 to 50 cents for a 12 hour day for the children and perhaps about double that for the adults. So you might be saying, wait, what, for the children? Yes, of course, this was the day of child labor. And so the children were used in all kinds of capacities here, often because they were smaller, they could get into places more readily. Uh, the people often lived on site and that of course, of course, kept them beholden to the company. Another thing that happened during the 1880s, which I think is very, very fun, is the first viaducts were being built. So today, we really don't have many viaducts left. We have the Colfax Viaduct and one or two others. But for those of you who were in Denver prior to the 1990s, you might remember the numerous viaducts we had around downtown Denver. And if you look at the very large drawing on the left-hand side there, you see one of those viaducts going through there. If you look down here across the train tracks and across the river, you're going to see one of those viaducts going out over the river and such to connect the communities on the northwest slope of the city, on the northwest side of the city. For a long time, the communities on the other side of the river 
were sort of cut off from Denver because of the river. We had a little less speed in the growth because of that lack of connectivity. Uh, during the 1880s, uh, Nathaniel Crawford, not Crawford, Hill, I'm sorry, Nathaniel Hill, the son was Crawford. Nathaniel Hill built our first viaduct, the 16th and Larimer viaducts finished in 18, I'm sorry, the 23rd Street viaduct was finished in 1887 by Nathan Hill, and the 16th and Larimer viaduct finished in 1889. So we started to spread out. This, of course, had the wonderful benefit of allowing folks to get up and over all of these things that were dangerous, like the train tracks or the river. So those who walked or were taking the streetcar or the horse and carriage could get up and over these things. In the picture on the left, that large conglomeration of refineries up there that you see, that is actually described as being in the city of Argo. Argo, of course, is almost completely unknown today. It'd be right about where uh, Park Avenue and 38th meet I-25 up in that part of the world. And for those of you who were our long Denver residents, you might have heard of the Denargo Market, which was said to be halfway between the cities of Denver and Argo. All right, we put in some other buildings in the city that were not devoted to governmental work, as with the ones we saw earlier. Uh, I have a lot of buildings to go over in this presentation, I guess. Sorry, I'm sniffly because of all the sneezing I've been doing. So, if you look the building on the upper left-hand side, that of course is Union Station. Now, if you feel yourself to be confused, saying, wow, that doesn't look like Union Station, you are partially correct. The original Union Station was begun in 1880, finished in 1881. If you look at this building, the wings of the building are original. The middle section would burn in 1894, would be replaced. In 1914, they got rid of the middle section completely and built it out as it looks today. So when you go to Union Station, that's why the uh, medallions on the front of the stations say 1880 and 1914, the wings 1880, the middle section 1914 and the wings are original. Sadly, the new section doesn't have that wonderful steeple there, but there it is. In the upper right-hand side, you have the Denver Dry Building. The Denver Dry Goods Company uh, originally was smaller. They would add on to it over time. Trinity Methodist Episcopal Church that you see there in the lower right-hand side opened in 1888. Originally, it did have working, uh, a working carillon inside. Uh, today, sadly, it is recorded music, which I think is sad, but I guess it's really expensive to keep up a carillon. I think we only have two functioning carillons in the city of Denver, and it's sad. How many of you have gone on a carillon tour? If you haven't gone on a carillon tour, you should. It's a lot of fun. Okay, and the picture that you see sort of in the lower middle, that is the Boston building. So I wrote down a fun quote from the newspaper when the Boston building opened in 1889. Quote, the first of the strictly modern office buildings, one of the finest and costliest buildings in the state. Some of the architects who arrived during the 1880s in Colorado, Montana Fallis, John James Huddart, William Lang, some big names who would end up doing, of course, gigantic things in Denver and around the area, Montana Fallis especially, made his way all over the Front Range. All right, so one of the other things that was really pushing a lot of development in Denver was the smelters. In the 1880s, a variety of factors pushed for smelting to be located out onto the prairie. Uh, Mr. Grant's smelter actually burned 1880, oh, good night, what was it? 1882, after his smelter burned, he relocated it to Denver. Others up in the Black Hawk area found that the ravines were not super good for making a lot of flat space for smelters, so they located down into Denver. So some of the names we associate with big industry in Denver's history got involved. If you see the fellow there on the right-hand side, that is Dennis 
C.D., the most carefully pronounced name in all of Colorado history. Do not say his name too fast, or your third and fourth grade tour groups will think you've said something else. An absolute pandemonium will ensue. Trust me, I know. So again, his name is Dennis C.D. Dennis C.D., super famous for being a completely morally corrupt person. Uh, his way of getting rich, charming in its way. Uh, where was that building? Ooh. Was that one of the previous slides? Are you talking about this, this present, uh, this, uh, where was that building? Mm. You're gonna have to be more specific. All right, I guess I'll wait for, uh, oh yes, the one below. So the Boston building is still downtown. Oh, that's located about what? 18th and 18th and Stout or so. It's still downtown. If you look up on uh, on the mighty Google, giver of all informational blessings, uh, the Boston building, it's still down there, about 18th and Stout or so. I apologize for not having an exact address for you, but the Boston building, the Google will get you there. Okay, uh, Dennis Sheedy, the fellows that you see there on the right-hand side, he would find a piece of land that he wanted with a business on it, and what he would do is he'd open a business right next door selling the same products, but he'd be selling it for about a quarter of the price. So if you were selling a pair of shoes for a dollar, he would sell a pair of shoes for a quarter, you would go bankrupt, he would get your land, and then he'd end up getting richer. So not a very fine fellow. Uh, the gentleman there to the left of him, that is Charles Kuntz. These are some of the folks who were helping to bring the smelter industry to the Denver area. A uh, picture of the upper left-hand side there, a fellow working in the smelting industry drew many, many immigrants to Colorado, especially in the Globe area. Mr. Sheedy created the Globe Smelter, and that led to the creation of the city of Globeville. The picture that you see there in the middle with the smokestack, that is the Globe Smelter smokestack before it was torn to the ground in 1951 to show you how important smelting has been as an industry in Denver. You should look at this picture. If you look, the uh, seal for the city of Denver is on the right. And to the left of the state capitol dome that you see there, uh, the Kuntz family started the Colorado National Bank. That is true. Uh, never fear, I'm, I'm not sharing all of the details about these people, but yes, the Kuntz family, they had several brothers. They had their hands in pretty much every pie there was, which is in the olden days, a very smart strategy. If you had your hands in every single pie, then if one pie went sour, you still had tons of money. That is a lesson that uh, the Tabers, well, Horace Tabor at least, did not learn. So the city seal on the right-hand side that is the globe smelter, the smokestack of the globe smelter there that you see to the left of the Golden Capitol Dome. And for those of you who don't know where Globeville is, if you look at the map here on the left-hand side, if you look at the very top of the map in the very middle, you're going to see a golden colored neighborhood with sort of a hand at the upper right-hand side, that is Globeville. That would start out as the separate city of Globeville later becoming the Denver neighborhood of Globeville. <clears throat> and that is where those smelters were put along with Illyria and Swansea. Okay. So another fun thing that happened during this time period, Denver got its first amusement park. I have been unable to find, oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Sorry, 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 sorry. This is the Richthofen Castle. My apologies, yeehaw. So the city of Montclair was formed during this time period. The Baron von Richthofen came from Prussia and he created the city of Montclair way east of the city of Denver. And he was certain that this area was going to become the next hot spot for all of the rich and the famous to move in Denver. So he incorporated the city in 1888. And here is what they said about it. Okay, quote, a pure moral atmosphere 
in a pleasant suburban town, combining the advantages of country and city, where both health seekers and pleasure lovers might, at leisure, enjoy the surroundings at once tasteful and convenient to Denver. So that is how they build the city of Montclair in one of their promotional brochures. And they might actually have done great. I mean, look at the building that you see here. This is the Baron's Castle. If I were to show you a picture of it now, it is almost completely obscured by trees, of course. The Baron von Richthofen, unfortunately, had some bad luck. Even though the city was founded in 1888, it was soon going to be done in by the crash of 1893. And so the Baron's dream of becoming rich on real estate was snuffed out as the city was absorbed into Denver. So 1888, the city of Montclair founded. Even though this was not in Denver, it's such a great story, I feel I have to say it. For those of you who know the history of Inglewood or were with us on the uh, Inglewood tour that we did in November, I put down some numbers here. Streetcar mileage in Denver during this decade went from 10 miles in 1870, I'm sorry, 10 miles in 1880 to 96 miles in 1892. The most famous of the streetcars that was put in during this time was in the city of Inglewood, and that was the Cheryl Inn, which was opened in 1888, I think it was. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, 1883, opened in 1883. Now, most of the streetcars were powered by horses or mules originally. This one was famous because the horse would pull the streetcar up the hill, but riding back down the hill, the horse would ride the streetcar. And it was such an amusing little diversion to be riding a streetcar with a horse that the Sherilyn streetcar, founded in 1883, actually survived the removal of all of the other animal power streetcars in Denver. All of those were gone long before the end of the century. The Sherilyn streetcar remained horse powered, as you see here, until 1910. And I think that's just such a great thing. For those of you who've been to the city hall in Inglewood, uh, they have the restored Sherilyn there for you to enjoy. So uh, a quote from a developer, a most, excuse me, as most Denverites could not afford a horse and buggy, public transit was essential to moving many people out of the city's core. That decade alone saw 527 new subdivisions platted and 75% of those were created from 1887 to 1889. Even with that, the city suffered chronic shorting, shortage of housing. So Denver was going absolutely bananas in every direction. All right. One of the things that happened during this time period, I didn't have any way to explain this to you. So I, am, I did this, I made this illustration and it shows you basically the full majesty of my computer abilities. So on the left-hand side is a neighborhood, and on the right-hand side is the same neighborhood after something began. Denver used to have a crazy street system. Each of those subdivisions, the person platting it out, would choose the names, and often those names would not be even remotely close to the names in the neighboring subdivisions. And as they came together, streets would change names. The street I live on once had eight different names. Each one had its own numbering system. What they tended to do in the olden days was do a, a numerical order numbering system, which is what you see on the left-hand side. So the numbers would simply count up from a spot and they might change sides. So here you see one, two, three, and it goes on from there. Well, starting in the 1880s, 1887 specifically, the city began the process of converting Denver over into a decimal grid where each block would basically have a kind of uh, a number, a hundred block basically. So here you have the intersection of 25th and Humboldt in the Whittier neighborhood. Between 25th and 26th 
would be the 2500 block. So the houses would have their numbers converted. All of the addresses on the east side would be the even and on the west side would be the odd. And that way they don't go in numerical order, they go by the 100 block decimal order. This is something I'm hoping we can talk about each of the next few presentations, the slow conversion from the crazy streets over into the sensible streets that we would end up getting later. So that began in the 1880s, and I think it's a great thing. Okay, we also uh, would see later on changes with this. We began renaming the streets as well. <coughs> if you look at the map on the left-hand side here, look toward the upper left, it says West 12th, but notice in parentheses, it says Pine Avenue. In this section of Denver, just west of Broadway, the original street name was Pine Avenue. The one below that, Deer Avenue. Today, we would know it as 11th. And below that is Moose Street. I'm sort of sad we didn't keep Moose Street. Today, these would be 12th, 11th, and 10th. One of the things that also started in the 1800s was the codification of our street grid, which is why if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, this is from Westminster in their historic district, uh, just west of their original downtown, they have the modern street grid, and then they have the signs that show you the original street names. Uh, so they are honoring their history. So this is something that began in the 1880s. Eventually, most of the cities in the metropolitan area would join in with the Denver street grid. I won't name names for the cities that foolishly did not, because some of you might be from those cities. Hmm. All right, so far we have touched on the Tabers each and every decade. We have many, many more decades. We're gonna talk about them until the 1930s. The Tabers, I'm hopeful you all know the basic story of the Tabers. If you do not know it, I'm not gonna be sharing it with you here, I'm sorry. You may either write me afterward or look it up online, lots of sources. So we've had the Tabers come to Colorado. We've had the Tabers work hard, but not be rich. We've had the Tabers get filthy, filthy rich. And we've had the Tabers get a divorce. Uh, actually, that happened at the beginning of this decade. Horace and his first wife, Augusta, got a divorce. In 1883, Horace and his second wife, Elizabeth, most of you would know her by the sobriquet, Baby Doe. They got married in Washington, D.C. in 1883. Thereafter, along came their daughters, Elizabeth, better known as Lily and the second daughter who is better known for the rest of her life as Silver Dollar. So the 1880s, let me tell you folks, a great decade for the Tabers. If you look at the picture on the lower left-hand side, that is the Windsor Hotel. So I wrote down a quote here. All right, the Windsor Hotel, Tabor and Company. Horace Tabor, listed as vice president of the First National Bank and as residing at the Windsor Hotel. So Horace Tabor was part of the construction of the Windsor Hotel, although by no means was he the sole person responsible for it. This is where he kept his future second wife while he was getting a divorce from his first wife. And since he had so much money, he gave a lot of it away and he also built a lot of things the building, that lovely building that you see on the right-hand side there is the Tabor Grand Opera House. Sadly, that building no longer stands. So these are what Mr. Tabor was building during the 1880s, such a great decade. Oh my goodness. I bet they wish that decade had never, ever, ever ended. Okay, another thing that came in during this time period built was the Byers Evans House. All right, someone's saying, my grandmother who was born in 1889 loved Baby Doe. She constantly talked about her even after Baby Doe had died. I do not doubt it. Uh, that lady was absolutely a legend and she's still a legend, which is why every 10 years or so, you get the chance to go see the Ballad of Baby Doe at the Central City Opera House. We last saw it, uh, we saw it, excuse me, last time it was out. Next time it comes out, I wanna take another tour group. That was a great day. So in the upper left-hand side, you have the Byers-Evans House Museum, 1883. 
It is not called the Byers Evans House Museum anymore. So I wrote down the name because I have not memorized it yet. The Center for Colorado Women's History. And the other two pictures you see are from that building. Uh, I asked a friend of mine who used to work there to write up a paragraph for me. My mom named one cat Baby Doe. Well, I hope the cat came to a better end. I asked a friend of mine who used to work at Byers Evans to write me a little paragraph. And it, it's so great. I'm just going to read it out to you. For William and Elizabeth Byers, the 1880s brought a move to a new home at what is now 1310 Bannock Street. They had lived in many locations in Denver. Perhaps they were leaving bad memories of Byers' mistress behind at their last home, for she had tried to murder him at their Sherman residence in 1876. By 1883, their house on Bannock was ready. Italianate in style, it was one of many new homes in the area. Today, it is the only house left in the neighborhood. The Byers lived at the home until 1889, when they left for the, quote, countryside in what is today the Baker neighborhood. Their time at 1310 Bannock saw a different neighborhood. Originally, Grace Methodist Church and the Evans Chapel stood next to it. The uh, Evans Chapel, by the way, is now on the University of Denver campus. Uh, after the Byers family moved out, John Evans, former territorial governor, moved into the house. Many of the uh, excuse me, generations of the Evans family would live in the house, including uh, Ann Evans, whom many of you know. All right. So the Colorado S Center for Colorado Women's History, if you haven't been there, as I'm told, the interior of the building still looks pretty much the same, even though it has a new name. So that one was put in in the 1880s. And now this is a story that doesn't get told very often, so I thought I'd shout it out here about the Denver Circle Railroad. Really is one that is not much in the public consciousness. The Denver Circle Railroad opened in 1882. The Rocky Mountain News wrote, an epic in the history of Denver. The Circle Railway, when completed, will be 20 miles in length, completely surrounding the city with its track and stations, and will be the means by which the new the now cooped up inhabitants of the city may reach suburban homes at a trifling expense and with a rapidity that will rob distance of its terrors. So let me show you where that is. So if you look, here's uh, the incorporation papers on the right hand side. You have Cherry Creek here on the left hand side. Downtown is on the right. Today, the Auraria campus is what you would have here on the left. So there is a really great website that talks about the La Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood. And I got a lot of the research from them. And here's what they wrote on their Across the Creek website. And it was so pithy, I just thought I'd go ahead and keep it. Uh, there it is. We may imagine the path that the Denver Circle Railroad took. It started across the creek from downtown at Larimer. Its trellised tracks ran along the bed and veered onto Willow Lane and Clark Street, now Inca Street at Capitol Avenue, which is now 14th Avenue. It is remarkable to imagine that a train ran straight through today's King Supers and continued south a short block parallel to Santa Fe Drive before heading south. So for those of you who have shopped at that King Supers there at Santa Fe and 14th, I've shopped there. Once upon a time, there was a train running through that exact spot. Now, one of the reasons that the train was going south is because William Loveland, you may recognize him from the city that bears his name, was promoting the development of that area and he wanted it to sell for maximum profit. So he needed a train to get us there. So here you have a picture of the old country club that was the Jewel Park Country Club. Today you would recognize it as Overland, the Overland Golf Course. So the Jewel Park Golf Course there. And another thing was in the early 1880s, we had our mining exposition. The National Mining and Industrial Exhibition ran in the building that you see here, 
1882 to 1884. For those of you who know the streets down south of Alameda, there's one called Exposition. Exposition, the street gets its name from the fact that it was the boundary of the grounds for that exposition. exposition. Now, unfortunately, the building uh, and all that was on the site torn to the ground. When it was open, it was amazing. Folks loved it. It was a place where you could show off all of the products of the state. Quote, it is an idea that the exposition, exposition, I can never say that word. It is an idea that the exposition should become permanently an annual event, open on August 1st, closing September 30th. <laughs> we will fill it with all of the necessities and provisions of the state, all of the best of this barren desert brought into fruit, all of the mining wonders brought from below the earth. Uh, it lasted for three years, so that's pretty amazing, but did not go beyond that, unfortunately. Another thing that we got, this is the slide that I mistook earlier, we got our first amusement park. Three years before Elitches came in, we had Riverfront Park in Denver. So this park is on the southeast side of the river between 15th and 19th. Today that is called Riverfront Park, the neighborhood, but Riverfront Park was an amusement park. It was done by the fellow you see there on the right-hand side. I guess he's trying to look a little pensive. That is John Brisbane Walker. He would give us the summer White House on the top of Mount Falcon that never actually saw a president. He also donated the land for uh, Regis University, and he helped with the founding of the city of Berkeley, which is now the neighborhood of Berkeley. So, ladies and gentlemen, our first amusement park, Riverfront Park. We'll talk about Elitches next month. Soapy Smith, great guy. Love this guy so much. He was a scoundrel, a crook. He was famous for his soap scam, where he would fool people into believing that these bars of soap would have money wrapped around them. And if you paid $5 for a bar of soap and unwrapped it, you might win $100. No one ever found $100. He was robbing people of all of their money and eventually was run out of town. He is shown here in the picture on the upper right-hand side with my favorite man in all of Colorado history, Robert Spear. You may know that name for Spear Boulevard. Robert Spear, at this time in the 1880s, he had reached Denver. He came because of tuberculosis. He got into real estate. Today, what was known as the Arlington Park area of Denver, today is uh, just part of the Alamo Placida neighborhood. And the park that you see here on the left, that is the first project that he ended up coming with, up with uh, to make himself a lot of money. We'll talk about that next month. So Mayor Spear, even though he was, I should say, Robert Spear, he was not mayor yet, would give us this beautiful park that you see on the left, and there he is on the right. Uh, we are going to be talking about this fellow a lot for the next three presentations. Love this guy so much. So gird your loins, ladies and gentlemen, because Robert Spear is coming your way. In the 1880s, we don't have a lot to say about him because he just was getting started. So here, uh, please ignore the terrible punctuation error in the first sentence. I know it's it's offensive even to look at, but please don't please don't hold that against them. Uh, in 1880, we had the Hop Alley Riot, where Denver's Chinatown was uh, basically destroyed. It wasn't completely destroyed, but enough damage was done uh, that it was essentially removed. That is why Denver does not have a Chinatown. The anti-Chinese sentiment that I was talking about in our last presentation did reach a fever pitch and it came to violence in 1880. So I wrote down some numbers here. Uh, oh, and some really ugly quotes I saw out there when I was doing my research. During the Hop Alley Riot of 1880, the census shows about 238 Chinese in Denver. By the end of the decade, the population would increase until it was beyond that original number but the Chinese coming in never tried to make a Chinatown again. Another wonderful thing that started in the 1880s is Valverde started to grow all kinds of things. And it started to grow a wonderful celery, excuse me, a wonderful vegetable that is very dear to my heart. And that is celery. 
love celery. I know a lot of people are thinking, what? But I love celery, it's so awesome. So Valbird celery would end up becoming super famous. It was grown all uh, in the Valbird area for decades. They ended up producing upward, I wrote it down, of 6 million bushels a year in the Valverde area. I'm not sorry, not six, three million bushels a year in the area. It was shipped as far east as Chicago. And it was even written up in Denver's, uh, our wonderful Denver's municipal facts. So if you look here, what I outlined in pink, uh, if you end up getting the recording of this presentation, you should pause it right here and read what I highlighted in pink there. It's a kind of prose, in my opinion. It's wonderful poetry about celery. I'm gonna go get myself some celery when I'm done with this presentation. Another building that went in during this time period was the Brinker Institute, which was a school. You see it in the olden ways on the right-hand side and the modern Navarre on the left-hand side went in during this time period. During this time period, we also began in earnest the fight for suffrage on the left-hand side. I found the logo, the upper right-hand side, I had to laugh. That was the logo, believe it or not, for the Prohibition Party, which was founded in Colorado at this time. The Prohibition Party was founded in 1884. And of course, what is a camel? A camel is dry, get it? And another thing that started in the 1870s, we started having some uh, labor strife. I wrote down some of the other things that started, the Knights of Labor. And Lynn, I'm so sorry, we're about to end this presentation. Uh, the Knights of Labor came in during this time and some other movements. So we will be talking about that in future presentations. All right. So at this point, uh, Lynn Lunau just joined in. Do you know why it's called the Navarre? So we, they did tell us why it was. And this is the story they told us there. It's called the Navarre after the area in Spain. So that's where they got the name. So for those of you who came in late, or for those of you who had any technological issues or whatever it might be, uh, I really don't mind. You are welcome to shoot me questions and such, and we'll get you all set. The presentation is also recorded. So if you need it, I will be happy to send this to you after the fact. And I just wanna talk about some upcoming pieces here. We still uh, have some space left on North Dakota and on Amachi. Uh, I did do a visit to an internment camp in Arkansas, the trip I just got back from. So you see that in the upper right hand side. So that is our presentation. For those of you who missed it, I apologize. Go ahead and shout out with any questions. And we'll get you all set. All righty, I don't see any questions coming in. So folks, happy night and I'll see you again soon.